Welcome everyone to the 2021 Benavia Caregiver Connect. We are so happy that you joined us today. My name is Joanne Thompson, President and CEO of Benavia. I want to give a huge thank you to Taylor and our wonderful marketing department at Benavia who put this together. And then also a huge thank you to City of Peoria and Channel 11 for hosting us today. From our Benavia family to your family, our prayers and hearts go out to anybody that's been affected by COVID. Please know if you need anything, we are here for you. At Benavia, we are continuing to provide services, but we need your help. I have a huge call out to volunteers right now. If you wanna help uh, give people rights to doctor's appointments or go grocery shopping, or just be a friend to a senior in the area, please visit our website for more information. Thank you to our Caregiver Connect sponsor, AARP Phoenix. We truly appreciate you for helping putting this on today. It truly does take a community of support to help Benavia provide all the services to our local community members. Thank you to our presenting sponsor, Arrowhead Lexus, and all of our wonderful signature sponsors, our CARES partners, and our vendor sponsors. If you want to help in our efforts in a local community, please consider the Arizona Charitable Tax Credit. You can give your tax credit up to April 15th. So if you're going to get your taxes done for the state of Arizona and you find you have a little bit of a liability, you can always donate to Benavia, dollar for dollar tax credit. More information is on our website. And now I have the wonderful privilege to introduce Dr. Chaudhry. She's a clinician and an educator, educator who sees patients uh, with cognitive uh, concerns at Banner Sun Health Research Institute. Dr. Chaudhry comes to Banner from Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, where she finished her fellowship in cognitive and behavioral neurology. She received her medical degree from the University of Alberta in Edmonton, Canada. Dr. Chaudhry is a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada. She has a special interest in the identification of Alzheimer's dementia and related diseases in their early stages and conducts research at the Banner Alzheimer's Institute to understand them better. She also strongly believes in the education of patients, colleagues, and junior trainees in identifying these conditions and making better partners in care. Please help me welcome Dr. Chaudhry. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for tuning in and thank you for that very kind introduction. So I am a cognitive neurologist and my job is to try to figure out whether the memory and thinking changes you're having is due to a neurodegenerative condition, as in a brain condition that deposits abnormal proteins in your brain that is toxic to the brain, eventually causes shrinkage of the brain. And I want to talk to you today about symptoms and signs that you or your loved ones may experience that are not just memory loss. And the reason I want to talk to you about this is because there is a real need for recognition of this kind of, uh, of these symptoms. Um, a lot of times we associate memory loss with early signs of dementia or degenerative conditions, but that's not necessarily true. And recognizing some of these other symptoms may lead to early detection. And early detection means finding the underlying cause earlier, treating your symptoms better, keeping you safer, and avoiding crisis. Uh, putting the supports in place, connecting you to places like Benavia, and ultimately improving your quality of life. And how do we do that? So when you come to me, I listen to your symptoms. I look at the cluster of symptoms you have, and cluster of symptoms tell me patterns. And these patterns help direct what tests I'm going to order. And once I have those tests, I'm able to put together a plan for what the underlying proteins may be and how to help you manage your symptoms, treat you better, and what the standard of care is for that particular type of problem. And then I am also able to offer you research, which we do uh, heavily at Banner Sun Health Research Institute. And the most important part is to, to um, match you to the right research study for the right 
protein problem that you may be having. And that is why detection and early recognition is really, really important. And I've put up our information for Sun Health Research Institute there and our phone number of how to contact us. Um, but we will come back to this later in the talk where I talk a little bit more in detail about the research studies and the different avenues we offer. But before we get into the talk, I want to talk a little bit about how cognition occurs. So symptoms rarely occur in isolation. Uh, however, you may notice one symptom more than the other. What do I mean by that? So let's say you are a TV personality. Your job is to be on TV and talk. Well, if you're having difficulty finding the right words to say, it's gonna to come to the forefront pretty quickly. Let's say you're a taxi driver and your job is to navigate. Well, you know, if you're having difficulty percepting depth or having difficulty with directions, well, that is gonna to come to the forefront pretty quickly. However, if you have a job that requires you to be in a room by yourself, sitting in front of a computer, you may not notice that you're having difficulty speaking as much, and that may take longer for you to notice those difficulties. So as a result, you know, recognizing and being aware of things becomes all the more important. The brain is a really, really complex organ. Um, different parts of the brain can produce really, really same symptoms or similar symptoms. And sometimes only one part of the brain is affected and that can affect multiple aspects of your function. So it's really important that you work with your provider and come seek medical attention when you're seeing changes. And the other thing I want to, you to keep in mind as we go through this talk is um, don't walk out of here worrying about every single symptom being an early sign of dementia. Uh, we all have lapses in memory, in judgment, in thinking. You know, I walk into my kitchen 10 times a day not knowing what I want to get. And that's okay. What we're really looking for is changes. So that change can occur in terms of frequency. So you're doing something you used to do a little bit of, but more often now or in severity, so the change is about more of how difficult it's making your life and you're having to give up functions that you previously were able to do. So that change should prompt evaluation and coming to seek medical attention. And the last thing I want you to recognize is going to your doctor if and when you're noticing these changes is never and I repeat, never a bad idea. Because if you come to us because you're concerned and you're worried, and we find after testing and talking to you that everything is just fine, well, I'll be the first one to reassure you and give you that good news. We love giving good news at our center. So please get checked out if you're concerned about yourself or your loved one. We want, I want to talk about the continuum of cognitive dysfunction first before to kind of give a, a background. So you'll hear me talk a lot about cognitive dysfunction. And what, what I mean by that is people don't wake up one day and all of a sudden they have dementia. That is rare and, and not usually due to a neurodegenerative cause. What usually happens is people go through several stages or they may skip a stage here or there. And what we want to do is we want to have you come to us in some of those earlier stages. So step one is when you're unimpaired. So you're going about your life, you're doing all the things you do, you're living your life. And then you may or may not have a stage that's called subjective cognitive impairment. Don't get bogged down by the terminology. I want you to understand what it means for you. So that subjective cognitive impairment is when you notice some changes in your function, in your experience. And you come to us, we do the testing, and everything is looking good. And you're and we find that you're performing well within your normal. 
So we say to you, you have subjective cognitive impairment. Now that may be due to many different causes, one of which is neurodegenerative conditions, so a brain condition. Some of the people who have subjective cognitive impairment may progress further, and they have something we call mild cognitive impairment. And that means you notice the changes, I detect the changes in my clinic, uh, but even though you are perhaps maybe having to put a little bit more effort, you're still able to do all the things you need to do in life on a functional basis, if that makes sense. So you're still living your life, but it's taking a little bit of extra work than it used to. And then some people who have mild cognitive impairment will progress further and will end up having what we call dementia. So dementia is when you notice changes, I detect changes, and it's affecting you in, out in the real world. You're having difficulty doing things you normally do in life. So that's like saying you have knee pain and that's why you cannot walk. Well, it tells me nothing about the cause of your knee pain, so to speak. Um, you know, is it your bone? Is it your ligaments? Is it your muscles? Um, and that's the same with dementia. When people tell you you have dementia, it tells us nothing about the cause of dementia. Is it because you have infection in your brain? Is it because you just had a stroke? Or is it because of a neurodegenerative condition such as a toxic, gradually progressive brain process that is going to shrink your brain and continue to progress in a slow manner? And that is my job to get you there. Now, I know I said I wouldn't talk about the memory symptoms, but I need to tell you this. A lot of people come to me and they say, you know, I was having a little bit of difficulty with my short-term memory, but my long-term memory was just fine. I can recall things from way back, you know, when I was a veteran um, and I have no difficulty. In fact, I keep telling those stories again or people keep hearing those stories again. Well, your brain can be affected whether you have a dysfunction in short-term memory or in long-term memory, or in both. So if you have a change in one or both, I still encourage you to get checked out. So it's not uncommon for the long-term memory to be affected much, much, much later in the disease process. And usually it is the short-term memory that goes first. The next thing I want you to appreciate, so don't worry about the details that may show up on your slide, but what I want you to appreciate is that memory is a multi-step process. It takes a lot of steps, and regardless of which step gets affected, to you it may feel like it's your memory. So step number one is to, to form a memory, is to be able to see and hear things properly. So imagine being in a room where the TV is running, but the volume's really, really no, low. Are you going to know what the details of that program is? I bet not. So that's the same thing when you have a hearing impairment. You are missing things because you're unable to hear the conversations. So getting your vision and getting your hearing checked out is very, very important. The second thing you need to be able to do is to pay attention to what's going on. So remember when you sat in meetings and you were really, really tired and you dozed off and you didn't pay attention? Well, do you remember the contents of that meeting? Likely not. And so same idea, if we are not paying attention because we're taking naps during the day or we're or we just, we just don't have the attention while well, we cannot remember details of conversations. And then you need to be able to learn the pieces of information. So imagine somebody t giving you directions, you know, turn left, then go straight, turn right twice. Well, what do you have to do? You have to repeat it in your head a few times. Well, that's your working memory coming into the forefront. Um, 
And sometimes you may have to repeat that in your head until you write it down in your, so to speak, short-term memory in that sticky note that you put in your purse. Well, hopefully you'll take that sticky note out of your purse one day and put it in a, more, in a safer place, otherwise that sticky note is going to get lost. And that's essentially you taking things from your working memory to your short-term memory and consolidating it into your long-term memory. And finally, at some point, you know, you, so for some memories, we attach emotional things to it. So, you know, that wonderful trip you took with some of your best friends, well, it's vivid in your brain because not only did you experience it, but there was an emotional connection to it. And that's why we remember pictures better than, you know, me just giving you words to remember. Uh, we remember emotional memories. We remember things, details about our loved ones better than, you know, how many, um, uh, uh, how many news articles we read or you know that your favorite sports team that you really like to know the stats of that's because of emotional memory so as you can imagine any of these things going wrong can look like memory problem so what else is there that can look like memory but is not really memory problem so that is something called difficulty with planning or organization. So let's say you had to do multiple tasks and all of a sudden you're having difficulty with planning and organizing. So you are leaving some of the details out and you're not really completing the tasks. That may look like a memory problem. You're just forgetting, but you're not forgetting. You're having an organizational problem. Similarly, as we talked about with attention, if you cannot stay on the task, you don't complete them, and then it looks like you forgot to get them done. So that's when you're cooking and you need to think about all the recipes. If you're absent-minded, you're gonna forget things you put on there. So again, sustaining attention is important. Fatigue and sleep deprivation, I cannot stress this enough. As we all grow older, our sleep is affected. The amount of time we uh, spend in deep sleep or slow wave sleep begins to decrease. That is the sleep we, that is the part of the sleep we use to consolidate memories. So if you are the kind of person that had sleep problems all their life, well, guess what? It's gonna get worse as you get older. And so you have to work harder at getting good sleep because then you need to work on having memory problems. And finally, sometimes language problems can look like a memory problem. So what do I mean by that? Let's say you're having difficulty understanding words. Well, if I give you instructions and you just don't understand them, it, it may look like you forgot to do what you, I asked you to do. However, it was just an understanding comprehension problem. It's like, you know, listening to a foreign language, basically. So now we're gonna move into other symptoms that can occur in various different parts of the brain that can be an early sign of a neurodegenerative condition beginning to develop. And I want you to not get bogged down by some of the terminology I use, but to recognize how it can show up in your life. So, um, we're going to divide the brain into four different parts, and uh, if it's showing up in your, on your screen, it should say it, there is a red part, a green part, a yellow part, and a blue part, and I'm going to refer to these colors. So we're going to start at the back of the brain and work our way forward, and I'm going to talk a, a little bit about how we put things together. So we can have different parts of the brain being affected, and that can lead to other symptoms, such as you may have difficulty with visual problems. So there are visual variants of degenerative condition. You may have language problems, like I just talked about. You may have difficulty with mathematics or organizational and planning problems. You may have difficulty with movement, the classic example being Parkinson's disease. Or you may have changes in your personality and behavior or your mood and all of these things can present as an early sign of a neurodegenerative condition. 
So again, we're going to go to the brain. We're going to start at the back, the occipital lobe. Don't worry about the name. It's the back of the brain, right back here. And what it does is primarily visual processing. It's the visual center of your brain. So I have people who come into my office that say, I can't see. But my doctor says, my eye doctor says, my vision is fine. I've been to multiple, multiple eye tests. They all say my vision is just fine. I want you to recognize that if you're going to your eye physicians or an optometrist and they're checking out your eyes um, and everything is looking good, think about the possibility of a brain problem. To be able to see, your eye pathways start at your eyes but end at your brain. Um, I used to have a mentor that said the eye is the window to the brain, and that's actually very, very true. So, for example, if you want to see something, right, and your brain does this in milliseconds, and you don't even recognize that this happens, but let's say I show you an orange or an apple. Your, your eye takes that information, sends it to your brain, and your brain sees it, the color, the texture, the shape, and then it goes to this dictionary you have in your brain where it tells you, well, so when something is yellow, orange looking, round in shape with that peel, well, that's an orange, or what is an apple? And so you see the thing, though your brain sees the shapes, and then your brain associates previously known information about apples and oranges. However, if that part of the brain is not doing its job, well, the brain's not seeing the shapes, the brain's not seeing the, the colors, then you may not know that this is what an apple is, or what you don't, may not know what the shape even looks like, so you may not actually know what it is. But what will it actually look like when you're experiencing it? Or how will you notice it in your friends and family members? So you may start to notice driving changes. People may have difficulty reading exit signs. They may have minor scrapes on the car as they're coming out of the garage, or they, you know, because they just don't have that depth perception anymore. They may be missing stop signs because they just didn't see that out of the periphery of their vision. They're not seeing the dividing lines very clearly, so they're veering off. They may have difficulty reading books and solving crosswords. Why? Because of that line. They're not seeing those lines easily. They have difficulty working with spreadsheets. So accountants who cannot now see spreadsheets and make sense of it, having to increase the font size on your phone, on your Kindle, um, and sometimes missing the forest for the trees. And what do I mean by that? So sometimes people have this situation where they look at a table, and for example, they may, you may look at this table and you say there is a computer here, there is a mouse, there is a piece of paper, but you may miss the forest that there is someone sitting and you know, talking on a table and in a broadcast situation. That is the forest. So you may see the individual components, but not the overall picture, because that is visual processing that's occurring in your brain. So again, I don't want you to worry about what syndrome this would cause, but if you're seeing these changes and your eye exam's normal, well, come to us. You know, we will evaluate you. And this is done by a part of the brain called the wear pathway. So you, you will see up on your screen, there's a pathway that goes from up uh, the brain, and then there is a pathway that goes from the bottom of the brain. So there's the wear pathway and the what pathway. The wear pathway tells us where in space are things located for us. And the what pathway tells us what is it. And so I want to talk to you a little bit about the what pathway first, because it extends into the green area of our brain, as you're seeing on your, um, seeing on your screen, and it is a very common symptom, the trouble with faces. So most people get very, very alarmed when their loved one do not recognize them. You know, they couldn't remember my name, they couldn't remember who I was, 
they confused me with someone else. So it is important to get that evaluated because can, can you, do you guys know who this person is? I bet you if you don't have a teenager in your home, you don't know who this person is. However, these people, you know, some of you in your 30s, 40s are going to know, but some of you may not know. If you're not watching TV, if you're not into pop culture, you're not going to know. How about this person? Everybody knows this person, right? Everyone knows the president. However, I would be alarmed if you didn't recognize the current president. But if you didn't recognize the other two, that would not alarm me. So if you don't know someone, you're not going to recognize them. And that's not as alarming to me. However, if there is previous knowledge of someone and you're forgetting them, well, that can be a problem. However, we all have instances where we can't remember the name of that person. We've seen them and we cannot place them where we have seen. In isolation, that is not that alarming. Remember what I said, it is not one symptom or one sign that causes me alarm. It's putting things together. So if you came to me and you said, I am not remembering people I used to know, and in addition, I'm having changes to my driving abilities and I'm missing those stop signs. Well, now I'm beginning to worry a little bit more. However, you know, again, one thing is not enough, but it is the patterns that we're looking for and what areas of the brain that may be affected. So next up is language. So we're now moving into the green area of the brain. Remember what I said about memory, multi-step process. Same with language. It's a multi-step process. Different pathways are affected in your brain, and I don't want you to worry about the pathways. I just want you to understand that different areas of the brain produce speech, and different areas of the brain understand speech. And again, if one or other is affected, it may affect your language. What does it look like for you, though? You can have difficulty with names, finding the right words you want to say. So often uh, that shows up in conversations. People are using a lot of filler words. Um, they're, they're, they're going around the words they want to say. They're describing them. And their loved ones may have to step in and fill in. And this causes a lot of social anxiety for people. And I, say, I often say to people, it's OK to have to describe the words. If your loved one needs to step in and fill in, that's okay, because we don't want you feeling the anxiety in a social situation. You may also have difficulty understanding the meaning of the words. And like I talked to you before, you know, it may look like you're forgetting. It may look like it's a memory problem. You may not know how to do simple instructions. So you may not know what a hammer means, for example. You may give up reading because you are not uh, understanding the plot. Um, you may have spelling errors when you're writing. And maybe you're not writing anymore. You forget writing checks. So these are all symptoms of having a language problem. And sometimes the language problem occurs along with the memory changes. So all of these other symptoms can occur along with the memory changes or before it. So language problems occurring several years or months before can be called primary progressive aphasias. And you will hear this term quite often. Again, saying that you have a primary progressive aphasia just means that you have a primarily language problem. We still need to figure out what that underlying protein is because to, to the best of our ability before taking, without taking a chunk out of your brain, which we don't do while you're alive. So we still need to figure that out. So come to us so we can test you better and help you, you know, deal with some of these symptoms. Next up is motor and sensory problems. So there is a part of our brain does that, that does motor 
and sensory pro uh, processing. So you know how you just know how to ride a bicycle? You just know how to use a toothbrush? Um, well, that's motor programming, motor memory in our brain. You know, you just know that the button goes to the front of your, of your shirt. That's also motor programming. So when that yellow part of your brain starts to get affected, then you have what we call praxis errors. Don't worry about the name. Again, you may have difficulty putting on clothes. Um, so you may put your shirt on inside out, upside down. You may forget how to tie shoelaces. And again, these things can come with the memory changes, after the memory changes, and occasionally before the memory changes. These people uh, can also have difficulty with calculations. So um, oftentimes people will say that they used to be really, really good at math and now they cannot do simple additions and subtraction. Well, that's the yellow part of the brain. It helps you do math. And if that's affected, you may have trouble doing math. And finally, some people will come to us and describe a phenomenon known as alien limb phenomena. Don't worry about the name, but people will say to us, this may sound really, really crazy, but my hand does its own thing. It just, does it, it just doesn't listen to me. It will just start moving on its own. And that's a rarer condition and not, as, not seen as often. But if something like that is happening, that is a brain problem. I want you to come see us. Other things that can affect movement is the deeper parts of the brain. The classic example being Parkinson's disease. So we all know that when people have Parkinson's disease, they may have movement problems. So that you may shuffle, you may have difficulty walking, your balance may not be the same, you may have shaking. So that's classically in our mind, and that's by the deeper parts of the brain. Lots of uh, patients with Parkinson's disease and its cousins. So there's a family of diseases that are related to Parkinson's disease that may have some signs of Parkinson's or Parkinsonism, as we would call them, along with some of the changes in thinking and memory. And, and the brain can decide to pick and choose which symptoms are going to come to the front first. Um, and so, again, these uh, people will often uh, present to us early because, you know, they may be having falls. Uh, but it is usually once we dig further, we may see that some of these other symptoms that we are talking about may have occurred even previous to some of the movement symptoms that are starting to show up. So now we're at the front of the brain, the blue part of the brain. And you see how that is a pretty big chunk of the brain. And that's because it does a lot of things. It does so many different things. So behavior and personality is modulated by the front of the brain, called the frontal lobes. And when people start to have changes in their behavior or personality, um, it could be because that part of the brain is being affected. So people may become apathetic. So they're not as interested. They're not as, they may seem like they're not as motivated. They may even seem depressed. But you know, what they are experiencing is apathy. They may start to change their personality. They may become unkind. They may say inappropriate things. They may do inappropriate things. They may forget their table manners because that's the filter of your brain. You know, our frontal lobes tell us this is an inappropriate thing to do socially. They may have obsessions. You know, they may start hoarding things. And sometimes they can be very innocuous things. I had someone come see me because they were hoarding bicycles. Well, that's not really a problem in their garage because they have a huge garage, but obviously it's out of character for that person. And that's what I really want you to think about when you're seeing your loved ones uh, or your friends and family or yourself, things that you're doing completely out of character. 
you may also take up gambling or or you may be craving carbs you're having too much sweet i had someone who was who was drinking gallons of orange juice a day um, obviously that's out of character for them and Similarly, you may be consumed with alcohol and that can cause further problems in your uh, thinking and memory. So as you can see, the range of problems can vary and I'm giving you some stark, very severe examples, but the changes can be minute and really, really little, but still noticeable for people. And finally, the front of the brain also does something called executive function. So this is your air traffic control center, the CEO of the brain. This is the area of the brain that receives information from other parts of the brain about emotions, about efforts, about planning and organization and kind of relays and, and then does other, uh, and, then, and then kind of uh, appropriately modulates your behavior. So it is the, also the part of the brain that monitors yourself. And it helps, uh, it's helped by the, what we call the prefrontal cortex. So this part of the brain, the really, really front part of the brain. And that is sort of the support services, so to speak, for the CEO, you know, your administrative folks who keep everything organized. So as you can imagine, all these different parts of the brain work together to finally do really, really complex things for you. So this is the part of the brain that helps you do multi-step stuff. It helps you multitask, switch between two different tasks, learning new things. Let's say we give you a new appliance. Well, how do you learn how to use the new appliance? Let's say we give you a brand new car. How do you learn that? That's this part. Of the, of the brain. Um, you, this is the part of the brain you use to organize all your finances, do your taxes, plan your trip, you know, make sure that you have the tickets right. So all of these things are done by the executive function. So, when, and so you can imagine if someone's having difficulty with this part of the brain, it affects their life. Um, very, very widely. You start to lose a lot of functions. And we see that quite often in people who may be working a little longer. So people start to lose their jobs for, because of this. And we don't recognize it because we think, well, you know, they're, they're having anxiety or, you know, they're just going through a rough patch. Well, could be. Um, however, um, it could also be that their executive function is getting affected. Now, sometimes people may have executive function getting affected and not recognize it for a while. So let's say um, you're retired and you know you have a lot of help around the house and you're living with your kids and grandkids. Well, you know you may not be doing some of these complex tasks anymore because you don't need to, and uh, we may not really notice it until you can't use the remote anymore. So something very simple like that, you may have difficulty with. So it may take a long time for you to actually come to us. So that's why keeping your brain active is really, really important because some of these changes can show up when, only when your brain is active. So maybe uh, if you're doing puzzles more often or, or uh, crosswords more often, these changes will start to show up. And finally, I want to talk a little bit about sleep and mood. I always say this to people. There are two things that make everything worse, and that is having depression or anxiety um, or being sleep deprived. Both of these things make all your symptoms significantly worse, and they can contribute to it, and they can make it, you know, 10 times worse. Now. We're also finding out in research that sometimes these can be one of the earliest signs that some things begin to change. So someone who has never really had depression for most of their life is suddenly beginning to have such refractory depression, so such deep depression that is just not being well treated. Well, maybe that is an early sign 
of a neurodegenerative condition. So we really, really want to keep a tab on something like this. It is possible that your depression is worse. However, um, you know, we want to make sure that we are understanding these processes. And there's a lot of research now going into figuring out how early changes in mood, in depression, and anxiety actually affect your cognition for the future. And all the behavioral changes I talked about and some of these mood changes often end up uh, presenting to a psychiatrist. You know, people often go to a psychiatrist and it takes many, many years for them to come to the neurologist because people are just getting treatment for the symptoms that they're experiencing, the psychosis, the hallucinations. And that's important. You know, we work with our psychiatry partners to make sure that your symptoms are well controlled. But, you, but I also want people to be aware that they need to come see us so that we can make sure that it is not a brain disease in addition to the psychiatric illness. And finally, sleep. So sleep, we talked about how sleep gets worse as, as you age in life and how that can contribute to both consolidation of memory. There are also some phenomena that occur in sleep that can be associated with neurodegenerative conditions. So for example, people who have Parkinson's disease can often have restless leg syndrome. So you know, they need to move about quite a bit, particularly when they're trying to go to bed at night. Or they can have something called REM sleep behavior disorder, which is a dream enactment problem. So what happens in this case is people are acting out their dreams. Um, and, so, and we're finding out that sometimes these can occur many, many, many years, sometimes decades, before someone can manifest the cognitive symptoms. So not everybody who acts out their dreams progresses into having Parkinson's disease or one of its cousins. However, some of them do. And at this time, we don't quite understand who will progress and who will not progress. And we want to understand that better. So there is a North America-wide study called the NAPS Consortium, N-A-P-S, um, that is looking at you know, people who are having dream enactment behaviors and therefore, which, you know, what are some signs and symptoms or what are some uh, imaging changes that may then, you know, push them towards going further. And, the, and again, people can injure themselves. They can fall out of bed. And we want to be able to ensure that, you know, we treat them because the treatment is actually quite simple. We can treat you. Your partner doesn't have to sleep in a different room because you're punching them at night. So that is REM sleep behavior disorder. And I finally uh, want to end with saying, you know, now that you recognize these things, I hope that you will seek attention more often and earlier. It helps us help you better. It helps us improve your quality of life. And it helps us uh, offer more than just giving you a diagnosis, helps us offer you research. So um, I'm putting up our information again for Banner Sun Health Research Institute. We have a variety of clinical trials. Some studies are observational where we're just monitoring people over time. Some of our studies are uh, more treatment related and, and there's a wide variety of studies depending on what your symptoms are, what stage of the condition you may be in, um, and some of them are for people who are at high risk. It doesn't necessarily mean you're going to go ahead and develop the disease. So we have a wide variety of uh, options. Come uh, learn about it. Just because you're learning about it doesn't mean you have to sign up for it, but I encourage you to learn about it. And then finally, I want to just give a plug-in for something called Brain Health Check-In. So we have a Center of Healthy Aging. So if you're not feeling great or your loved one is kind of hesitant to go to the doctor right away, we understand we are scary people. But 
you know, come check us out at the Center of Healthy Aging. We give you a little test, ask you a few questions. We give you a little report card with red, green, yellow. And maybe when you see that red or the yellow, maybe that will push you just a little bit further to come see us in a clinical setting. So just to wrap this up right now, I just want to say that hopefully this has made you a little more aware of some of the other uh, symptoms that can be early, early signs of neurodegenerative condition, and I hope that you will seek treatment sooner and allow us to help you better. Thank you. Doctor, thank you so much. That was just fantastic information. Um, I'm actually going through something like this in, in my life right now, and this information just standing here was was fantastic, so thank you so much for that information. Uh, for the audience, my name is Tim Iden. I'm the communications manager here at the city of Peoria, and I'm gonna be running this Facebook Live. So we are live on Facebook, and I do see a lot of you out there watching. This is an opportunity to have some of your questions answered, and we did get some questions ahead of time from the public, and I'd like to ask you a few of those now. Yeah. So uh, the first one, and I know it's on a lot of people's minds, is, um, is uh, dementia hereditary? Yeah, so uh, I get this question probably once a day in my clinic. Um, and the short answer is it can be, but not necessarily. So I'll explain that a little further. So I always give this analogy um, that a mentor of mine once told me about, and that is think about it as like making a bowl of chili. So you're gonna put in a lot of different types of ingredients in it. Um, some spicy, some not so spicy, and how the level of spice is going to kind of balance out the different ingredients. So we are born also with a genetic template, which has risk factors, so risk genes. It has protective genes. Some risk genes increase our risk. Some, risk, some genes decrease our risk. And there are other factors, like environmental factors, so how much, our, how much education did we get? How much um, you know, alcohol do we drink? Did we smoke? Do we have high blood pressure? So all the things we do in life that are not so great for our health, but also great for our health, like physical exercise. So all of these things are playing this balancing act um, based on, and that is eventually determines our genetic risk. And so uh, for most disease processes, that is how our genetics work out. So we may have gotten a risk gene, but we may have also gotten protective genes, and they will have to balance out. There are some, very few, disease processes where one gene is equal to symptoms. And usually when that happens, people have symptoms really, really early on in life, in their 40s, um, sometimes in their 50s, and at other times, um, you know, they have a very, very strong family history. Um, thank you. And another question, um, I'm kind of a procrastinator when I get sick and I always wait to go to the doctor and I know that's not something we should do. Um, and a lot of people are asking themselves when, when is the right time? Um, if I'm dealing with a, a loved one or a family member or even myself, um, how do I know when the right time is to come and see you if I'm having memory loss issues? Yeah, so the right time is when you have the concern. That is the right time. So like I said, it is never a bad idea to go to your doctor and talk about the concern. Um, if you come to me and you know I just tell you that, hey, I understand your concern, but we have checked you out and you're looking really good. We'll check you out in one year's time and make sure things are the same. Well, that's great news, right? That's me telling you, you don't have a really bad condition. We love that news. So absolutely, if you have concern or your loved one has concern or if you are thinking, you know, I'm seeing some changes in my mom, my dad, you know, my spouse, and I, I just want to, you know, make sure they're doing okay. Well, come to us. And a lot of people come to us and say, you know, we just thought it was age-related changes. And some of us do have some age-related changes, but we are here to tell you that. So come to get it checked out. How do we start that process? So if we have someone we're concerned about, what's my next step? So um, there are multiple ways. So number one is sort of the center of healthy aging um, locally, as I, as I talked about. 
um, and you can just go in and you can have a little bit of check. Uh, it's not a doctor that's looking at you at that point. It is a, a brain health check-in center, but it may give you a little more confidence uh, to say, okay, you know, my concern is just not out of the blue. There is something real going on. I should go to the doctor. You can start with your primary care physician. Your primary care physician is well equipped to listen to your concerns and start the process. And you can also uh, request a cognitive neurology evaluation. Uh, so your primary care physician can refer you to, the, uh, to that, or you can just call our office and self-refer. Thank you so much, Doctor. Thank you so much for your time. The presentation was fantastic. I'd like to say to everybody at home, um, if you have a question, maybe you didn't get to watch this live and you're watching this uh, at a later time, um, you can post your question right here and we'll be monitoring it. Or reach out to Benavia for help. Um, the City of Peoria has our Peoria Support Division and we offer so many support services um, and we can point you in the direction of Benavia, um, we can point you in the direction of any one of our sponsors um, and, and get you the help that you need. So uh, feel free to reach out to us on Facebook, feel free to reach out directly to Benavia um, and again Thank you so much uh, for your time. The presentation was just more valuable than I can, I can tell you from a, a personal point of view. So thank you. You're very, very um, welcome. We're going to take a commercial break here real quick. Coming up next, we have uh, Don Pudo, who is coming here from uh, Hospice um, of the West. Um, and she is going to, she's a patient co care coordinator at Hospice of the West. So she will be here right after this short five-minute break. We'll be right back. Many of us take for granted the ability to get into our vehicles and drive ourselves to the grocery store or to a medical appointment, the ability to easily change a light bulb or an air filter, or even the ability to leave our home for a lunch date with a friend. Many members of our community are no longer able to leave their homes and they rely on the help of others to assist with these daily tasks. What I do for Benavia with several of the clients, I do grocery shopping, I do friendly visits, I pick up their mail. Um, some, of them, some of the mailboxes are a little bit further than they can go, uh, so I pick up their mail and take it to them. Uh, I've picked up medication, um, I've run some to the, the doctor, some to the bank, uh, just a little bit of everything. Nearly 90% of older adults prefer to remain in their homes as they age. However, maintaining independence can be challenging for many of our neighbors. My son-in-law put me in touch with Benavia because uh, every summer he goes to uh, Alaska for approximately three to four months and he was worried about how I would get along without someone to kind of watch over me. The first time that I met Diane, she told me a lot about herself and I talked to her too about me and just about anything and everything. And uh, we hit it off okay and it's been that way ever since. We're each other's angels. She kept saying, you're my angel, you're my angel. I said, no, you're my angel. So we're each other's angels. <laughs> right? It may be tough to find a sense of community these days. Am I off mute? Can everybody hear me? But at AARP Arizona, we're bringing the community to you. Hi, everybody. Glad you could join. Oh, it's so good to see you all. What are we gonna learn today? Let's get started. Whether it's reading a good book. I am so glad we got to read historical fiction today. It is my favorite. Learning something new. <laughs> How did that sound? Three, Adding a spring to four. your step. Do it again. One, two, three, four. Or telling someone you care about them. Connecting with others is just one click away. Visit aarp.org forward slash near you today and find a new community tomorrow. 
Our uh, mission is to enrich lives in the community, so we serve the whole West Valley. Um, we do a lot of stuff here at Benavia. Um, we serve older adults, we serve children, we serve families. So we do the whole spectrum of age groups. Um, so here in Peoria, we actually have our Family Resource Center. So we're serving families zero to five. Um, we're helping with parenting workshops. We do purposeful play groups. We help get on access applications, um, help guide them and do information and referral. We do navigation in the home as well for those who maybe are going through some struggling times. We also do free home services to homebound seniors in the community. So we provide transportation to and from doctor's appointments. We actually stay with the individual um, for the entire time um, to make sure that they have what they need. We also do grocery shopping for them or with them. We do um, friendly visitors, phone pals, um, errands, and also handyman services and some business assistance. And then we also have um, five life enrichment adult day programs. And so we have one here in Peoria on 83rd Avenue and Cactus. There we serve seniors um, who have um, dementia, um, Alzheimer's, stroke survivors, Parkinson's, and adults with intellectual and cognitive disabilities. I would say for them to call Benavia and we can definitely um, direct them in the direction that they need. We actually have family support coordinators that will go out into the homes and help kind of guide as they need to. We have, um, for our family resource center, we serve all the way past Wickenburg to Glendale. Um, so we'll meet the families wherever is convenient for them. We'll go out to libraries um, where we have a lot of our activities. Um, but for them just to start giving us, by giving us a call, we'll kind of direct them um, in where they need to go. And if we can't meet their needs, then we work with a lot of other agencies in the community that we can refer out to. And if um, you have any questions or need resources or um, anything in the community, even if it's in Peoria or outside of Peoria, just give us a call at 623-584-4999. Um, we are at the Peoria Resource Center every Friday morning. We have a staff there, but we can also have staff there um, for families if they make an appointment as well. And welcome back to Benavia's Caregiver Connect. We are so excited to introduce our next guest. Um, here from Hospice uh, of the West, we have Dawn Purdom. She's a patient care coordinator at Hospice West. She has a Bachelor's of Science uh, in Nursing from Grand Valley State University, which she received in 1996. Uh, 10 years of hospice experience spanning across admission, triage, um, RNCM team leadership, and the Director of Clinical Services. She values quality end-of-life care, allowing people to die with dignity on their own terms. She's passionate about educating others, empowering them to make choices for themselves and their loved ones as life draws near the end. She believes that everyone has the right to die peacefully and comfortably surrounded by those she loves. Thank you so much for giving us your time. Thank uh, we you. really appreciate you being here I'm honored here to be here. Thank, Thank you. you. So I'm hoping everybody's staying well during these times. Um, I think caring for a loved one is both a privilege, but also comes with a set of challenges. So I've worked alongside many caregivers over the years, and as I share with you what I've learned and from them as well as what I've taught them, I hope that you find the information to be helpful. I'm gonna be reviewing the types of dementia as well as the stages of dementia, what it looks like to have end-stage dementia and qualify for hospice, as well as the role of the hospice team in supporting both the patient and the family. It's important to remember that dementia is not a normal progression of aging. There's damaged brain cells and which affect the excuse me, ability to communicate cognitive capabilities and can lead to behavioral changes. Types of dementia include Alzheimer's, Lewy body dementia, vascular dementia, Parkinson's disease, frontal temporal dementia, as well as mixed dementias. Alzheimer's is the most common cause of dementia and includes 60 to 80% of the cases that we see. Alzheimer's is a degenerative brain disease that typically impacts the center of learning first. Early on in the 
um, journey of Alzheimer's, most likely you're able to, or unable, difficulty having, I'm sorry, have difficulty remembering new information. Advanced Alzheimer's impacts not only speech, swallowing, and also gross motor skills, including the ability to walk. Lewy body dementia is a brain disease that causes progressive loss of memory and the ability to think and plan. It is associated with protein deposits called Lewy bodies in the brain cells. Often you notice fluctuating attention and alertness. A patient or family member could become um, very confused very suddenly. They may struggle with visual spatial problems, um, having difficulty maneuvering through familiar spaces. They may also experience visual hallucinations that can be both vivid and detailed. Having the loss of ability to recall long-term memories and have repeated falls. Some symptoms of dementia with Lewy bodies are very similar to other brain disorders, including short-term memory loss as well as a shuffling walk. Some people with Lewy bodies dementia may have a variant, which is a combination of both Lewy bodies and Alzheimer's disease. Vascular dementia results from conditions that damage blood flow to the brain, depriving the brain of vital oxygen and nutrients. It often can occur following a stroke. Problems with reasoning, planning, judgment, memory, and other thought processes are a result of vascular dementia. Risk factors include increased age, history of stroke or high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, smoking, obesity, and atrial fib. Parkinson's disease is a, is a neurogenerative condition that commonly leads to problems with movement and motor control, but can cause dementia in some people. A decline in thinking, thinking and reasoning develops in many folks that are living with Parkinson's over a year. Lewy body deposits have been found to be linked with the brain changes in these patients. Frontal temporal dementia often begins at a younger age, as early as 40 to 65. The frontal temporal areas of the brain actually shrink or atrophy, leading to personality, behavior, and language changes. Movement disorders, including tremors, rigidity, muscle spasms, decreased co coordination, difficulty swallowing, muscle weakness, and inappropriate laughing and crying can occur. You're at risk for developing frontal temporal dementia is higher if you have family history of dementia, but more than half of these cases have no family history of dementia at all. There's up and coming studies that are associating frontal temporal dementia with the ALS disease. Abnormalities characteristics of more than one type of dementia occur simultaneously in mixed dementias. Autopsy research is showing that this is much more prevalent than we realized. We often can see Alzheimer's mixed with vascular dementia, Alzheimer's with Lewy bodies, or Lewy bodies with Parkinson's disease. Dementia progresses with seven stages along the journey. Stage one, you have no cognitive decline and the patient or family member is functioning as normal. In stage two, there's an age-associated memory impairment, mild decline, and including occasional lapses of memory. So very often, dementia can be missed during these stages. Mild cognitive impairment becomes evident in stage three, getting lost easily, unable to perform at work, forgetting names and family of friends, and difficulty concentrating are noted. Patients may begin to experience anxiety related to these changes. Mild dementia includes increased memory loss, the inability to retain information regarding current events, and difficulty remembering things about one's past. Disorientation, inability to manage finances or plan family events, and difficulty recognizing others. Due to these changes, patients become more socially withdrawn during this stage. During stage five or moderate dementia, patients become um, more dependent on their caregivers, having increased memory loss, disorientation to time and place, and have difficulty making decisions. Those with moderately severe dementia begin to forget those closest to them. They become unaware of their surroundings and unable to recall recent events, and they have skewed long-term memory. 
Symptoms and behavior may include delusional or obsessive behavior, anxiety, aggression, agitation, and loss of willpower. Severe dementia impacts speech and motor skills. Patients become dependent on others for eating, dressing, walking, transferring, and use of the bathroom. It is at this stage that when family are comfortable and in agreement with comfort care philosophy, that patients can be supported by the hospice team. When is it time for hospice? Um, patients progress through de their dementia journey and often activities of daily living, including showering, dressing, toileting, become difficult and patients require additional help. Later stage dementia patients become unaware or incontinent of their bowel and bladder. Dementia patients who are qualifying for hospice will also have changes in speech with limited ability to speak only approximately a half a do dozen of intelligible words. Hospice criteria also takes into account coexisting health issues, malignancies, respiratory disease, renal failure, liver disease, and congestive heart failure, for example. Additional decline may include aspiration pneumonia, recurrent or intractable UTI or upper respiratory infections, skin breakdown, falls, and weight loss. Many hospices have palliative or transitional programs that can offer support for patients who may not qualify for hospice quite wet yet. It is never too early to call for an evaluation and to explore your treatment options. I'd like to introduce to you Sally. Sally is an 81-year-old with Alzheimer's. She was diagnosed nine years ago at the age of 72. She's been hospitalized three times in the past year with a UTI and sepsis and twice for aspiration pneumonia. She's living at home with her husband and she speaks one to three word sentences. Since her hospitalization six months ago, Sally is no longer continent of her bowel and bladder. She has anxiety and agitation and sometimes acts out shouting and slapping at her husband. She needs assistance with showering and, and dressing but is able to feed herself However, she struggles with some foods and needs a soft diet and reminders to swallow throughout her meals. She's lost 16 pounds over the last year. Mr. Smith would like to keep her Sally home with no further aggressive treatment. Hospice is for people who are, um, excuse me, who are nearing the end of life. Services are provided by a team of healthcare professionals who specialize in managing symptoms and assuring that the patient is comfortable at the end of life. Hospice includes comfort care, managing pain, anxiety, shortness of breath, nausea, bowel issues, and other symptoms that may cause, may arise to assure that the patient is comfortable and has the highest quality of life for the remaining days. The Medicare benefit brings services to the patient in their home, whether that's a private home, a group home, an assisted living facility, or a bed in a long-term care facility. When electing the hospice benefit, the patient and family are electing for comfort care versus aggressive treatment. In addition to the hospice team, medications, personal supplies, and medical equipment are all covered through the hospice. Let me introduce you to the hospice team. The patient and family may choose to have their own physician or nurse practitioner follow while they're on hospice services, or they may elect for the hospice medical director to follow. Whether making recommendations to the private physician or provider or, following, or giving those orders directly, the hospice medical director has symptom management experience and meets to review each patient every 15 days with the hospice team. Once a patient's been on hospice for more than six months, a face-to-face -face encounter with one of the providers will occur to assess the eligibility as well as the plan of care. The RN case manager is the nurse responsible for establishing and updating the patient-focused plan of care. She visits at least weekly or often more frequently and completes a comprehensive assessment every 14 days. The nurse reports back to the following attending or hospice medical director and receives order to change me medications or interventions to assure that the patient's symptoms are well managed and that the highest quality of care is obtained. 
The hospice medical social worker provides emotional support to the patient, family, and caregivers. The social worker advocates for the patient's end of life wishes and assists with the do not resuscitate medical power of attorney and living wills to be completed when chosen. The social worker can assist with connecting the family with community resources as needs arise. The social worker provides pre-bereavement counseling and offers ongoing psychosocial support for the patient and the family. Hospice provides holistic care, including spiritual health. Often outside the context of religion, the hospice chaplain supports the patient and family in their spiritual needs at end of life. Through life review, emotional support, and counseling, the chaplain assists the patient and family in finding peace throughout their journey. The home health aid provides direct patient care, including showering and bathing, as well as light housekeeping activities. The, health, the home health aid follows a patient-centered and individualized plan of care that is set forth by the RN case manager. Although hospice does not cover custodial care, the hospice team does support the family and caregiver in the direct care of the patient during their visits and provides education for the caregivers to safely care for the patient changing, during their changing needs. Hospice also includes volunteers. Um, they offer additional socialization and support to patients and families. They can provide intermittent respite and allow the caregiver either time to rest or to get away from the home to run errands or seek their own health care appointments. Volunteers connect with our patients on a special level, whether it be through shared hobbies, service in the military, music, or pets. Hospice volunteers go out of their way to provide support for our patients. Let's return to Sally. Sally is visited by her hospice nurse weekly. The nurse comes in and does a physical assessment and visits with Mr. Smith to hear how things are going. The nurse assists and suggests um, suggestions for nutrition and offers a supplemental drink to try between meals. Although decreased intake is expected in time, nutritional intake will help Sally keep up her, her stamina as well as um, her skin and health. Sally is placed on a bowel regimen to help with constipation as well as scheduled Tylenol for her arthritic pain. A low dose of lorazepam is, is started for her anxiety and um, assists with her agitation. The hospice home health aide visits twice weekly to assist Sally in, in the shower and the team educates Mr. Smith on good hygiene and skin care techniques to utilize between their visits. The social worker visits with Mr. Smith every few weeks. They've reviewed their advanced directives and the medical power of attorney that designates Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith realizes that along the way he most likely will need assistance and the social worker has provided him with resources for paid caregivers. In addition, the social worker offers anticipatory guidance on what to expect as the patient progresses. The social worker is bringing out a list of local mortuaries for Mr. Smith to review at their next visit and will assist with making pre-arrangements as needed. The hospice chaplain is also visiting the Smiths every few weeks. Sally had been a part of her church choir and together they listened to church music um, which brings Sally some peace and comfort. Since Mr. Smith is unable to attend his own services, he feels supported also by prayer and scripture during these visits. Twice a month, Eve, the hospice volunteer comes in and Mr. Smith goes out for groceries. Eve and Sally enjoy listening to music together and looking through photo albums from Sally's past. In addition to the visits from the hospice team, medications related to the prognosis of the patient are covered by the hospice and are delivered directly to the patient's residence. Personal supplies, including wound care, hygiene, and incontinence supplies are also included. Therapies, as indicated, including speech, physical, and occupational therapy, as directed and ordered by the hospice medical director, are also provided. Nutritional services, including nutritional supplements, education, and dietary counseling, are given as well. At times, symptoms cannot be managed at home, and we have what is called the inpatient care um, level of care for hospice. 
The patient has around-the-clock nursing care in the hospice inpatient unit or a contracted facility while medications are adjusted and symptoms are managed. The patient then will return home once they are better. Respite care allows for a family caregiver to take a break for five consecutive days. The patient is admitted to a Medicare approved facility or hospice inpatient unit as the hospice team follows them while they're there. Hospice also includes bereavement services for the first year following the loss of a loved one. This includes individual counseling as well as group support. Let's talk about medication management during the journey. It's important not to count the days, but make the days count. Hospice prides itself in managing symptoms. At times, this requires new medications or changing the doses of medication a patient may have already been taking. The hospice nurse will count on the caregiver in sharing the type and extreme of symptoms the patient is experiencing. When non-pharmacological interventions no longer are working, she will consult the hospice medical director and possibly begin medication interventions. Deprescribing is a concept in hospice that includes decreasing doses or discontinuing a medication altogether to avoid side effects. Often as we approach life, end of life, medications no longer have the time to be effective. Other medications may have more um, adverse effects than benefits. Pill burden or taking too many medications all at once may also be taken into account as families decide to discontinue medications. The hospice nurse and medical director work together to educate the patient and the family on the best choices when it comes to medication regimens. Hospice has a start low and go slow philosophy. Because every medication has side effects, the idea is to use the smallest dose of medication needed to manage the patient's symptoms. The patient is started on a small dose and if the symptom is still not managed, the dose is increased in increments slowly for the desired effect to be achieved. Often pain with dementia can be managed with just Tylenol, either scheduled or as needed. However, if a patient has coexisting reason or history of pain, like a fall with broken bones, narcotics may be started using the before mentioned philosophy. Agitation, anxiety, and sleeplessness are often controlled with what is called psychotropic medications. The nurse will educate the patient caregiver and family on the side effects of these meds and assure that the smallest dose possible is used to manage their symptoms. Comfort is the main goal of hospice Patient and family goals are considered before medications are ordered. Depending on the patient's reaction and the dose of each med will be reviewed and adjusted. In addition to medications, the hospice team does a lot of education with the patient and caregiver. The hospice team will offer support and education in creating a safe, reassuring, yet stimulating environment through the progression of the patient's journey. Depending upon symptoms and decline, Patients may tolerate some things along the way that they may not tolerate later on. Creating a peaceful environment without too much visual or sound stimulation will assist in managing some symptoms along the way. Providing some familiar activities with the, for the patient uh, is also important. Activities may include playing cards, dominoes or a simple game, activity blankets, aprons or boards, matching socks or folding washcloths. The key is to provide a balance of stimulation the patient can tolerate. The hospice nurse will also educate the envi on environmental changes that can assist with fall prevention. Whether it be due to age progression or the progression of their dementia, many patients lose depth perception and become a high fall risk. Making minor adjustments to the home environment can avoid unnecessary falls. The hospice nurse also educates the family and caregiver on changing nutritional requirements and safety as dementia progresses. Often patients with dementia may lose the concept of what food is, be unable to feed themselves, have difficulty swallowing, and begin to require less nutrition as they approach end of life. Hospice can assist in providing supplements, making recommendations to the type of diet that is safe for the patient, 
and reinforce comfort feedings and oral care as the end approaches. The social worker continues to support the family and caregiver and if custodial, additional custodial care is needed, provides resources to the family for caregivers or a placement of the patient. Although custodial care is not covered by the Medicare benefit, the social worker can also assist the family in utilizing individual or state-funded long-term care resources. No matter where the patient calls home, the hospice team will continue to follow the patient and offer support to the family and caregivers. The hospice team, including the medical director, the nurse, social worker, chaplain, home health aide, and volunteer, all support the patient, caregiver, and family through their dementia journey. With intermittent visits through the week, the hospice team works with the family to assure that the patient's needs are being met, that symptoms are well managed, and provide ongoing education so that the caregivers can safely care for the patient and anticipate what may need be needed next. The hospice team is available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, to address the needs of the patient and family along their journey. No two dementias are alike and no two patients are alike. The hospice plan of care, including the focus and interventions, are individualized to the patient, caregiver, and family needs. We all come together to assure the patient's quality of life through to the end and ongoing support, offer ongoing support through the journey. Returning back to Sally, she continued to decline at home. Within months, she was unable to walk, and Mr. Smith secured caregivers to assist him in getting her up for a few hours each day. She continued to eat less and sleep more. The hospice nurse adjusted medications along the way and continued to manage her anxiety, pain, and constipation. Mr. Smith was supported by the entire team, and Sally passed away peacefully at home. Through the continued services of the bereavement team, Mr. Smith joined a grief group that he attended for months following her death. Although saddened by his loss, Mr. Smith shared his gratitude for the support received from the hospice team. I hope that you found the information that I shared with you today helpful. I'd like to open it up now to questions that have come in. Thank you so much. And we are uh, live on Facebook right now. So if you're watching on Facebook, you can head over there and type that question right in and we'll make sure to get it uh, addressed online. We do have several questions for you. So I'd like to uh, just get started with those. And let's start with um, how do I go about getting started uh, with the journey of hospice cares? W what are the first steps? Um, I would probably recommend calling and speaking with your primary care physician or provider at that time. However, you can, as a family member, pick up the phone and reference a hospice as well um, and make a self-referral is what we call that. Um, and again, it's never too early. Um, it, there's other programs that are available, like palliative programs that can assist if the patient doesn't qualify for hospice. Um, and it really just is an opportunity for us to start tracking the decline and get the patient on as quickly as we can. So uh, once I start the process, um, what are some of the questions uh, that I should ask uh, to make sure that hospice care is right for my family member or myself? So we, we really kind of review and talk about your goals. Again, um, as you elect the hospice benefit, you truly are setting aside the ability for aggressive treatment. So um, with that, basically a patient can't be on hospice services as well as admitted to an acute care facility the same day. And so we really just kind of review the goals of the patient and the family um, and, and see if hospice is the right fit at that time. Gotcha. And how long can somebody stay in hospice care? Um, when, a, when a patient comes on service, a provider actually certifies that they have a prognosis of six months or less, um, but that may not be the case. Um, so we're continually reevaluating that. At times, patients do graduate off hospice services, um, but there is an unlimited amount of benefit periods that a patient can remain on. So if they continue to qualify and have decline, we stay in place and support the family. Gotcha, very good. I know you talked a little bit about um, a pastor or chaplain. Uh, we had a question here um, that says, I have a strong relationship with our pastor. Um, do we have to have visits from our hospice chaplain? 
Can you explain a little more on how that yeah, works? Yeah, so the hospice team again has multiple people that are, are, are involved. Truly only the RN case manager is Medicare mandated, mandated to visit the every 14 days. Um, but we do want you to meet the other providers, but at any point you can um, let us know that you decline services either from the chaplain, social worker, home health aid volunteers. It really is that we're, we're hoping to come alongside you and give you the resources that you need. Um, but if it's not needed, then we, we um, limit our visits. Very good. And we had one more question about uh, medications. I know you talked about it briefly, um, but I'm assuming that's something you sit down and have a conversation with. How do I decide, um, for example, my husband continues to take medication for his cardiac disease. Can these medications be continued well at hospice? So a lot of times, um, we, again, we will kind of talk with the, the physician whether or not those medications are still effective. Mm -hmm. um, but most of the time, medications that are, are, are needed are continued. And because it's hard to say that that cardiac disease isn't um, part of why the patient is declining, those medications are covered through hospice as well. Gotcha. Um, those are the questions that we had. Is there anything else you'd like to add? No, I'm just thankful for being here today. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for coming. We, we truly appreciate it. And for those of you who aren't watching this live, who may feel like they missed out, that's okay. This is going to live on Facebook for a while. Um, you can also um, watch it on our YouTube channel. Um, so it'll still be out there for you to watch. And you can still ask those questions. You can ask them directly through our Facebook, and we'll get them to the right channels. You can reach out to hospice, and I'm sure they would be happy to help you. And Benavia is just such a fantastic resource um, for anything that you might need. We also have a program here at the City of Peoria called Peoria Support. And Peoria Support's goal is to hear what your needs are and point you in the right direction to our community partners like Hospice and like Benavia. Um, and you can find them in the City of Peoria um, website at, uh, Peoria, at cityofpeoriaaz.gov uh, backslash Peoria Support. Uh, for everybody here at the City of Peoria and on behalf of Benavia, uh, thank you so much for taking the time to watch. Thank you again to our sponsor, our title sponsor, AARP. Uh, we have a couple of real short um, advertisements here right after I'm finished. Feel free to take a look at those and they'll give you some more information. And thank everybody uh, who is involved with this um, for all the hard work and dedication. Thank you for taking the time and watching. Have a great afternoon. Many of us take for granted the ability to get into our vehicles and drive ourselves to the grocery store or to a medical appointment, the ability to easily change a light bulb or an air filter, or even the ability to leave our home for a lunch date with a friend. Many members of our community are no longer able to leave their homes and they rely on the help of others to assist with these daily tasks. What I do for Benavia with several of the clients, I do grocery shopping, I do friendly visits, I pick up their mail. Um, some, of them, some of the mailboxes are a little bit further than they can go, uh, so I pick up their mail, take it to them. Uh, I've picked up medication, um, I've run some to the, the doctor, some to the bank, uh, just a little bit of everything. Nearly 90% of older adults prefer to remain in their homes as they age. However, maintaining independence can be challenging for many of our neighbors. My son-in-law put me in touch with Benavia because uh, every summer he goes to uh, Alaska for approximately three to four months and he was worried about how I would get along without someone to kind of watch over me. The first time that I met Diane, she told me a lot about herself and I talked to her too about me and just about anything and everything. And uh, we hit it off okay and it's been that way ever since. We're each other's angels. She kept saying, you're my angel, you're my angel. I said, no, you're my angel. So we're each other's angels. <laughs> right? right? It may be tough to find a sense of community these days. Am I off mute? 
Can everybody hear me? But at AARP Arizona, we're bringing the community to you. Hi, everybody. Glad you can join. Oh, it's so good to see you all. What, what are we going to learn today? Let's get started. Whether it's reading a good book. I am so glad we got to read historical fiction today. It is my favorite. Learning something new. How did that sound? Three, Adding a spring to four. your step. Do it again. One, two, three, four. Or telling someone you care about them. Connecting with others is just one click away. Visit aarp.org forward slash near you today and find a new community tomorrow. Our um, mission is to enrich lives in the community, so we serve the whole West Valley. Um, we do a lot of stuff here at Benavia. Um, we serve older adults, we serve children, we serve families. So we do the whole spectrum of age groups. Um, so here in Peoria, we actually have our Family Resource Center, so we're serving families zero to five. Um, we're helping with parenting workshops, we do purposeful play groups, we help get on access applications, um, help guide them and do information and referral. We do navigation in the home as well for those who maybe are going through some struggling times. We also do free home services to homebound seniors in the community. So we provide transportation to and from doctor's appointments. We actually stay with the individual um, for the entire time um, to make sure that they have what they need. We also do grocery shopping for them or with them. We do um, friendly visitors, phone pals, um, errands, and also handyman services and some business assistance. And then we also have um, five life enrichment adult day programs. And so we have one here in Peoria on 83rd Avenue and Cactus. There we serve seniors um, who have um, dementia, um, Alzheimer's, stroke survivors, Parkinson's, and adults with intellectual and cognitive disabilities. I would say for them to call Benavia and we can definitely um, direct them in the direction that they need. We actually have family support coordinators that will go out into the homes and help kind of guide as they need to. We have, um, for a family resource center, we serve all the way past Wickenburg to Glendale. Um, so we'll meet the families wherever is convenient for them. We'll go out to libraries um, where we have a lot of our activities. Um, but for them just to start giving us, by giving us a call, we'll kind of direct them um, in where they need to go. And if we can't meet their needs, then we work with a lot of other agencies in the community that we can refer out to. And if um, you have any questions or need resources or um, anything in the community, even if it's in Peoria or outside of Peoria, just give us a call at 623-584-4999. Um, we are at the Peoria Resource Center every Friday morning. We have a staff there, but we can also have staff there um, for families if they make an appointment as well.